And in this video, I'm going to be sharing with you my own personal thoughts on who I believe killed Tucker, Tate and Rolf. It was a crime which pushed everything else off the front pages. Three men, all known criminals, found shot dead in the Essex countryside. It was a cold-blooded professional killing. The victims had many enemies, but which one wanted them executed? And welcome back to a new video on the Essex Boys case. As always, if you are enjoying the content, please do give the video a thumbs up. And if you're interested in the Essex Boys case or simply true crime in general, don't forget to hit the subscribe button below. The following police statement is from Karen Coppins, dated the 17th of May 1996. I am the above described and reside at the address given overleaf with my husband Andy and my children. My address is situated in a highly residential estate off of the London Road Rayleigh. London Road Rayleigh runs between the town centre area and the Carpenter's Arms public house roundabout on the A130. I use this road on a daily basis, often on foot, my doctor's surgery being situated on this road together with local shops. I have a keen interest in cars, particularly nice looking cars, and whilst out and about I pay what may be considered unnatural attention to them. Towards the end of last year, 1995, I recall I was walking along London Road towards the Traveller's Joy public house on the southern footpath, effectively against the flow of traffic. I believe about 5 or 6pm in the early evening, I recall seeing a dark coloured Range Rover driving towards me in the general direction of the A130. My attention was drawn to this particular vehicle because I like Range Rovers and this one looked in good condition. It stood out to me. It looked a top of the range flash car. As it drove closer towards where I stood, my eyes were drawn to the person sitting in the passenger seat. We made eye contact and he appeared to be staring right at me. This male was smartly dressed, what appeared to be a shirt and jacket. He was a large man with receding hair who appeared to be in his late 40s. I recall the shirt he wore was definitely white and the jacket was dark. He appeared pale and was not particularly good looking. The driver was also a large man. As the car got closer and passed my position, I noticed the car was full, with at least one other large man, but I'm fairly certain two large men in the back seats. I averted my gaze as it passed me because the front passenger was still staring directly at me. I went about my business and when I returned home, I made mention of seeing this Range Rover to my husband during conversation. I thought nothing further until the following day or possibly two days later when I saw a news bulletin on the television. I saw an item regarding the murder of three men in Rettendon. I took particular attention because when the news first broke through the local newspaper, I was told my husband knew one of the men, Pat Tate. During the television item I saw a dark coloured Range Rover on a low loading vehicle. I immediately said to my husband that that was the car I had mentioned to him the night before. During the evening I saw the Range Rover motor vehicle on the London Road, I believe it was either dark or getting dark. I cannot recall whether the street or vehicle lights were on. My view was unobstructed, from my position I have a long view up towards the Traveller's Joy public house. I wear corrected vision spectacles most of the time and certainly would have worn them when I left the house. I believe I paid particular attention to this vehicle from when it was about 50 to 75 yards away until it passed me. It was travelling at normal speed. I think the road is restricted to a 30 mile per hour limit. I would have had the car within my view for 5 to 10 seconds. Okay, so quite an interesting statement here. Now we have this Range Rover, we have the individuals described by Karen Coppins in her statements here. And I guess one of the first things that's going to be going through your minds at home is, well surely this is the Range Rover. This is a Range Rover containing Tucker, Tate and Rolf. It's by the Traveller's Joy pub, which is a key location in the Essex Boys case, as told by Darren Nichols and the prosecution in court. So surely this is Tucker, Tate and Rolf. This is the Range Rover that we're looking for. And I would say to be a little bit cautious about that, about looking and coinciding every sighting of a Range Rover with that driven by Craig Rolf. 
because what we have here is most likely not the Range Rover containing those three individuals. And there's a few pointers here to pick out, notably the passenger in the Range Rover. He is described as wearing a shirt and a jacket. It states that he was a large man with receding hair who appeared to be in his late 40s. I recall the shirt he wore was definitely white and the jacket was dark. We also need to be cautious regarding the timeline given here. She states between 5 and 6 p.m. Now, according to the statement of Donna Jaggers, Craig Rolf dropped her off shortly before 6 o'clock. We've got Tucker being picked up around 6 o'clock. So to me, we're not looking at the same vehicle here. We're not looking at the same Range Rover as that driven by Craig Rolf. Another thing which did flash through my mind, however, was this front seat passenger again. This description of someone in their late 40s, receding hairline, smartly dressed with a shirt and a black jacket. I guess the only person I could have uh, attributed that to would be Michael Steele. But then again, you'd need to ask yourself, why would Steele be in the front of the Range Rover and then somehow change to the back of the Range Rover? Because obviously when the Range Rover is discovered down Workhouse Lane, we have Tucker, who's actually in the front passenger seat, Rolf, who is driving, and Tate situated in the rear of the vehicle. Now, where I believe this gets quite interesting is that if, we, if we're really honest with ourselves here, if we're truly honest with ourselves in the way that we look into this case, most of us are either focused on the events put forward by Darren Nichols, as in the Range Rover travel down Workhouse Lane with Michael Steele in the back and Jack Wombs waiting in nearby bushes, by the locked five bar gate. We either sort of run that scenario through our mind or we may be even fixated on the story put forward by Billy Jasper that these individuals were killed at around midnight. What we tend to not do however is look at an alternative to that. We seem to be fixated on these two possible versions of events. Either they're completely guilty or the Billy Jasper theory is correct that they were killed at midnight. Now for me neither of these scenarios is wholeheartedly correct. So what is my own personal belief in terms of who is responsible for the murders of Tucker, Tate and Rolf? Now, before we get into this, clearly this is just one person's opinion. This is simply my own opinion. Now, I'm not here to present any information to you in a way which makes it sound like something it isn't or hoodwink you or pull the wool over your eyes. That isn't how I operate. What I like to do in my videos is to present the factual evidence with a little bit of theory alongside it, my own interpretation of what those statements may mean, and really I allow the viewers at home to interpret those statements as they see fit. But this is a common question that I get asked probably around three or four times a day in the comment section to my videos. Crime Scene to Courtroom, who do you believe killed Tucker, Tate and Rolf? Now this question isn't as easy to answer as it may sound. As I said earlier on in this video, we often get fixated on the story put forward by Darren Nichols, or a lot of people are starting to buy into this tale told by Billy Jasper. But for me, we're looking at a third party here, a mystery third party who's concerned in the deaths of Tucker, Tate and Rolf. One thing I can say categorically, however, is that I do not believe that Steele and Wombs are the shooters. Could they have had some involvement? Did they have some knowledge of what was about to take place? I think that is absolutely possible. Could they have lured Tucker, Tate and Rolf to the bottom of Workhouse Lane? Again, I believe that that is possible. Do I believe they actually squeezed the triggers on that night, December the 6th, 1995? I do not believe that. I don't believe they were actually the people who shot Tucker, Tate and Rolf but they could have had some outside influence in what was about to take place. Now, the reason that I say this is because there does appear to be quite a lot of corners cut in not just the planning process of these murders, but also their very execution. What I mean by that is the fact that we have Jack Wombs' workplace, g and commercials. We have a series of telephone calls on December the 6th made from a payphone at the Soul Horse just down the road from where Jack Wombs worked. Those phone calls went to Tony Tucker's mobile, and by all accounts, they were the calls which arranged the meeting for later that evening. So already here, we've got a linkage between Jack Wombs and Tony Tucker, or even Michael Steele and these individuals, depending on whoever was making those phone calls. So already, we have a mistake being made here. The second mistake is Jack Wombs taking his mobile telephone 
near the area of Rettendon on the evening of December the 6th. And this goes against everything that I have learnt about Michael Steele. He's very meticulous, very thorough, he likes to come up with a plan, he likes, to, he likes things to be done his way. You've only got to look at the way he brings the stuff over from Holland on the boat, everything's quite concise, he plans things out, he tries to execute a plan to the best of his ability. And I just don't think if these two individuals were solely responsible for the murders, that they would have cut so many corners. Would Michael Steele have allowed Jack Wombs to have taken his mobile phone that evening? Would he, have allowed, would he have allowed Darren Nichols, who by all accounts had no idea what was going on that night, to be the getaway driver? Would Michael Steele have allowed Jack Wombs to have entered that interview room with such a flimsy alibi, even months after the murders had been committed? Now, was Michael Steele some miracle criminal mastermind? That's not what I'm saying here. What I'm trying to say is look at his personality. Very thorough, very to the point. We're going to do things this way. That's the way they're going to be done. All very planned out, all very concise. To me, the alibi would look something like we were here, we were with this person between this time and that time. It would all be very congruent, all very together. It's almost as if they've been caught off guard, which is a little bit strange because if, you'd, if you had have committed triple murder, then there's obviously a chance that you're going to be questioned about that murder. But the feeling I get is, as I say, they've been caught off guard by this. Which again could go to suggest that they had some prior knowledge of what was about to take place or some outside involvement in getting Tucker Tate and Rolf to Workhouse Lane, but they never thought that the finger would actually be pointed directly at them. Could it have been that Nichols was also involved in this with Steele and Wombs, and when he was arrested... He decided that he couldn't tell on the real perpetrator of this crime whether there's some big crime syndicate or crime family or whatever. So he did the next best thing. He pointed the finger at Steele and Wombs. And the reason that he could do that is because he knew exactly where they were. They were near to the crime scene at the time that they were killed, but they weren't actually the individuals who pulled the trigger. Therefore, we get the long and drawn out story of Darren Nichols you know, driving these individuals away from the crime scene, the smoking barrels, passing of the guns between these individuals, the blood on the hands of Jack Wombs, yet no DNA found in the car that they recovered. He's then creating a story based around the locations of these three individuals, including himself. Another aspect or angle worthy of consideration concerning the Essex Boys case comes in the form of Darren Nichols' time spent on the Protected Witness Programme. It's during that time that he meets a fellow inmate, and this inmate tells a very different story concerning December the 6th to that told by Darren Nichols in court. This inmate claims that Darren Nichols told him that he actually took three individuals away from the crime scene, not just Michael Steele and Jack Wombs, but an extra individual. So could that lend some credibility to the possibility that Steele's role in all of this was to lure Tucker Tate and Rolf down to the bottom of Workhouse Lane via some kind of upcoming drug deal? Was the role of Steel, Wombs and Nichols to facilitate the lure and then take this third individual away from the crime scene after these murders had been committed? Is that a possibility? I think what counts against that idea personally is the fact that the police did recover the vehicle that Darren Nichols claimed he was driving that night, the VW Passat Estate. They tested that for DNA evidence, for blood evidence, for gunpowder residue, but it all came back negative in terms of a link with the deaths of Tucker, Tate and Rolf. Incidentally, they did actually find some gunpowder residue inside that VW Passat, but again, it could not be linked to the weapon which was used to kill these individuals. So either Darren Nichols is lying about the vehicle that he drove that night, which is, which is actually quite possible, or the killer was never in the vehicle to begin with. What we're going to do now is take a look at another eyewitness account, which comes from the morning of December the 6th, 1995, the day of the murders of Tucker, Tate and Rolf. The following police statement is from Francis Darling, dated the 11th of December, 1995. I am retired, but as a part-time job, I am employed by Essex County Council as an escort for disabled persons. This is a daily job and we travel from Chelmsford to Basildon via the A130. I leave Chelmsford usually around 7.20 to 7.30 hours 
and we normally arrive in Basildon around 8.45. Sometime between 7.55 and 8.05 on Wednesday the 6th of December 95, the coach I was travelling in was on the A130 Rettendon. As the road goes through the dual carriageway into a single carriageway, the road bears sharply to the left. On the left-hand side of the road is situated a farm shop and past this is a farm track. As we approached this farm track, I could see a dark-coloured Range Rover motor vehicle which was either black or blue parked in the entrance to this farm track and facing into it. Standing next to the Range Rover and on the south end side of the vehicle was three men. I can only describe these men as all wearing dark clothing and the one who was standing nearest to the Range Rover was taller than the other two and was wearing a hat. It appeared as though the vehicle may have broken down and they were waiting for someone and had been broken down for some time. I do not believe I would recognise any of the men again. I only saw these men for about two to three seconds as the bus passed them and I had a clear and unobstructed view of these men. So another interesting eyewitness account there. A Range Rover seen at the entrance to Workhouse Lane which obviously led down to the locked five bar gate and where Tony Tucker, Pat Tate and Craig Rolfe's bodies would later be discovered just the following day. So who were these three individuals with the Range Rover? Now, one of your earliest thoughts when listening to that statement will probably be, could one of these individuals have been either Pat Tate, Tony Tucker or Craig Rolfe? Now, what I think actually counts against that is when we look at the phone records for these three individuals. Now, telephone contact on December the 6th, 1995 between these three seemed to originate at around 9.02am with Tony Tucker making a phone call from his mobile phone to the landline of Craig Rolfe. Let's now take a look at another eyewitness account from a lady by the name of Jennifer Joyce Bosson. Her statement is dated the 23rd of the 2nd, 1996. I reside at the property situated near to the crossroads of the A130 leading to East Hanningfield and South Hanningfield. This crossroads has the Bell Public House situated on the corner. My occupation at present is a farmer and as a hobby I take my dogs to shows around the country. I do this with my friends Georgina Butt and Joan Erland. On Sunday the 15th of the 10th, 95, I was due to go with Georgina and Joan to a show at the Doncaster Racecourse called the Driffield Champ Show. I know it was this date as I have recorded it in my diary. The plan on this day was for Joan and Georgina to pick me up and take me there. I wasn't showing my dogs this day and intended on watching only and then I was going to drive back. In order to be picked up I had arranged to meet them by the slip road leading from the A130 to South Hanningfield Road on the Chelmsford bound track. This was between 4 and 5am. I recall arriving at the slip road between 4 and 5 o'clock. After I was there a few minutes I saw a Range Rover vehicle dark metallic in colour come down the A130 hill from the Chelmsford direction heading towards the crossroads. This vehicle pulled into the central reservation as if intending to turn right across the carriageway and into the South Hanningfield Road. The vehicle stopped in the middle of the carriageway and waited for a few minutes. Whilst they were waiting I could see there were two men in the front and possibly another in the rear. The two in the front appeared to be looking towards my direction. After a few minutes they moved off and into South Hanningfield Road. Again, after a few minutes more, the Range Rover reappeared and stopped at the junction of South Hanningfield Road and the A130. It again waited at this junction for a few minutes and I could see the males in the front were looking towards my direction. I initially thought they were lost, but because they kept looking towards me, I was worried. At the time, I was wearing a bulky maroon jacket with a hood which was up. A few minutes later the vehicle again moved off and this time it drove straight across into East Hanningfield Road and out of sight. Whilst waiting I recall a lorry stopping and the female passenger asked me the way to Coggershaw. I gave directions and when the lorry pulled away again I saw the Range Rover had appeared and was parked in the East Hanningfield Road facing towards the A130. The headlights were off and it was parked near the Bell Public House. It was at this point I could see another person was in the back. This person was also a male. The front people were still looking towards my direction and I became very nervous. They remained there for about five minutes, by which time Joan and Georgina arrived and I got in their car and told them what had happened. We then left and the Range Rover was still at the crossroads. 
I could only describe the persons in the front as males, mid-30s and of large build. They were wearing bulky jackets. The driver had a foolish face and had dark hair which was short. The male in the back did not look as big as the males in the front and I think he was younger. As a result of the murders at Rettenden in December 95, I have been in contact with police about the Range Rover I saw and the Range Rover the bodies were found in. All I can say in relation to the vehicle is that it was similar to the one police recovered. Right, so what sticks out to me in this particular eyewitness account is firstly the date in which it takes place, so the 15th of October 1995. Now we know for a fact that this can't be the Range Rover driven by Craig Rolfe F424 NPE as that Range Rover isn't even in their possession until the following month, November 1995. But what sticks out to me, as I say in this statement, is firstly the date in which it happens, the 15th of October, and secondly the location, South Hanningfield Road. We're talking about just a couple of miles from where Tucker, Tate and Rolf would later be found murdered. Interestingly, five weeks after this eyewitness account, the farmer finds the cannabis in the pond at West Hanningfield, just as I say, a few miles from where this particular eyewitness account takes place. Now naturally, with this eyewitness account, there's every possibility that it's completely unconnected to the deaths of Tucker Tate and Rolf, or even that drug drop at West Hanningfield. But I think what pulls me into this statement in particular, and the other statements that I've read out to you, is that there's a common theme regarding the individuals inside of that Range Rover and their subsequent behaviour. We had the first statement that I read out to you earlier from the 6th of December, the evening of the murders of Tucker Tate and Rolf, which described that woman walking along the main road, the Range Rover passing her, the passenger glaring at her, her feeling quite uncomfortable by that whole situation, and it almost seems mirrored by what this other lady is experiencing back on the 15th of October. Now, I've often said that this killing, this murder, was not just planned on the spare of the moment. Quite a lot of detail, quite a lot of thought has taken place in the planning process. So what are my own personal beliefs in terms of potential suspects for the murders of Tucker, Tate and Rolf? Well, as I outlined earlier, or as I touched upon earlier, I should say, I think we're looking at a mystery third party involved here. And that is why this case is largely so incredibly difficult to solve. I'm not one of these people that buys into the 12 o'clock theory. I think that the time of death at around 7 o'clock is largely correct for a number of reasons that I've outlined in previous videos. But I also don't believe that Michael Steele and Jack Wombs are the gunmen. So where exactly does that leave us? I think it's possible, and I'll say that again, I believe it's possible that Wombs, Steele and Nichols played some part in these murders in terms of a potential lure for Tucker Tate and Rolf to end up down the bottom of Workhouse Lane, or they may have known that these murders were about to take place. But simply put, I do not believe that either Wombs or Steele had their fingers on the trigger on the evening of December the 6th. One of the biggest issues in this case is that there are simply so many potential suspects. We had the death of Leah Betts, we've got the death of Kevin Whitaker and the loss of the money regarding that cannabis deal that fell through, we've got the internal struggles between Michael Steele, Pat Tate and those individuals. We also have the situation regarding Michael Bowman, an individual who served time for firearms offences both before and after these murders were committed. And as I mentioned earlier, my own personal opinion is that we have a mystery third party involved here. This isn't just as simple as Michael Steele, Jack Wombs and Darren Nichols being at Workhouse Lane on December 6th. There's a missing element in this case. There's a missing third element, a mystery third party, at least in my opinion, concerned in the murders of Tucker, Tate and Rolfe. 